So, good morning and welcome to church, church online. We're doing it together. Hey! We do exist in the same place at the same time. Sometimes. 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 Occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's great to have you with us today. We're really looking forward uh, to sharing uh, the word, some worship, and also communion as well. So, if that is a surprise or you'd forgotten, now might be the time to quickly pop and get yourself something in which you can celebrate communion uh, with us. Uh, and that time of remembrance. So there's your early warning. It's coming later. You have a little bit of time. We also have a couple of notices for you. Uh, the first one is that tomorrow we have a church members meeting, which is back on Zoom, is it not, Steve? It is back on Zoom. We have decided that we'd alternate from having ones in the building and ones on Zoom. It just gives more people the chance to be with us. Absolutely. So, yeah. so from a uh, selection of homes, dining rooms, uh, spare rooms, whatever it may be, we hope to see as many of you as possible on Zoom tomorrow. What time's that? So that's eight o'clock um, that will be starting. You can come on a bit before that if you want to, and we'll talk awkwardly amongst each other <laughs> as we do on Zoom before a meeting starts. So, yeah. so that's great. So we'll see you tomorrow, um, eight or just before, uh, on Zoom. The other thing that I'm sure anyone who will have been into town will have noticed is we are swiftly heading towards Christmas. Lights and decorations are slowly getting up, and we have some big plans as well. So, don't lie, you nearly wore your Christmas jumper today, didn't you? Uh, no, it, it literally only comes out for like once or twice in the week in the run up to Christmas. I, I can't, I just can't do it. <laughs> Too much Christmas jumper, it, it's not a good thing. But we have got plenty of excuses for me to get it out in December. There's nothing quite in November, is there? There isn't anything in November. You're looking here at the uh, this is the Newport Pagnell. I was going to say Christmas leaflet. That doesn't sell it very well. Uh, but this is the leaflet that will be, is available from Sunday. Information's on the website as well. But it's got everything that you need to know and tell your family and your friends and your neighbours about that we've got going on in the run-up to Christmas. Absolutely. The first thing I did is when I got hold of that, I was just checking to make sure my diary fits with all those plans. That's, that's five minutes of your time well spent. Absolutely. Uh, we don't want you missing out on anything over Christmas. So take a little bit of time, look through what, what we're doing. It'd be great to see you at whatever of those that grab your fancy, whatever events that we're putting on um, that you think, oh, cracking, that'll be a great opportunity to spend some time with church family and the community, hopefully, as well. Absolutely. And I would particularly highlight... And I think we may have said this to you before, church family, on the 19th of December, the Sunday before Christmas, in the morning, so we've got the carol service in the afternoon, but in the morning, we're all coming dressed as angels. Yes, you did hear me say that, we're all coming dressed as angels to the service in the building. Okay, church family? Good, I think that was a yes. I have my plan. Oh, we like. We like. Oh, 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 I don't know if I'll be able to pull it off. Or I need to spend a bit of time researching that one. But then anyway, I'd be love to see what some of you, some of your takes on angels might be. Looking forward to that one. Absolutely. Absolutely. But for the moment, Steve, would you uh, open us up in prayer just before we worship? Love to. Love to. Father God, thank you that we can be in your house or with you today from wherever we are. So thank you that we can meet as a church family in the building, but thank you that we can also meet as a church family from our homes. Father God, we pray that today we might have an encounter with you, that your spirit might come upon everything that we do online and everything we do in the building, and that we might be changed people because of it. We love you, Lord. We want more of you in our lives and we know that coming together as we do like this is one way that we open our hearts and our minds to have you speak into them. So, Lord, we pray that we don't miss that opportunity today. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to everything and anything you want to share with us today. And, Lord, thank you for the opportunity for us to share our hearts with you and to tell you how great we think you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so now it's time to worship. Uh, take a bit of time, sit down, listen to what God has to say uh, through this song. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song.
good to be with you church family um, and today we're there we're at the end of this mini series that we've been following uh, thinking about what it means uh, to be a generous people and it's just it's just one aspect of a growing feeling in that in this new season still working out what it means to come back together as gathered church um, after covid or living with covid there's a growing feeling that God is calling us deeper. And generosity is just one of the ways that we might think about that. And if you want to go deep, well, what better subject to talk about than money, eh? I kind of sense that as soon as I say those words, there's kind of an awkward shuffling in our seats. If it's not an outward thing, there's certainly an internal uh, feeling of discomfort. But it's strange, isn't it? Some subjects just seem to make us feel that little bit more nervous. And maybe, maybe that's why that to my knowledge, the idea of money and our generosity, how we live, how we manage the money that we have, isn't something that we've talked about much as a church. Isn't something that we've discussed and explored much as a church. Maybe our reaction to it also helps us to see why it's the last, or we've chosen to address it last in our series on generosity. Almost as though we needed to talk about the generosity of serving, the generosity of how we use our gifts, the very generosity of our lives before we could even contemplate the question of money. Well, I figured as I arrived today and as I share in the building with those who were there, that uh, there would be a nervousness. So I thought, hey, let's not talk about money at all. Let's talk about donuts. Yes, donuts. I want you to imagine today that somebody gives you 12 donuts. 12 donuts. Wow. Wow. And when you get them, you're, you're kind of you're contemplating, well, what do I do with these 12 sweet Beautiful, scrumptious donuts. Should I eat them? Should I have them for myself or should I give them away? Well, I, I tell you what, imagine just for fun that it goes something like this. Well, uh, one for me, because I quite like donuts, uh, but I want to be sure that I've got enough for me. So, yeah, me, me. Um, me, yeah, uh, me, 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 yeah, well, yeah, that one's for, for God or for somebody else, yeah? All right. There is a little bit of me that thinks we could just stop there. <laughs> that that very picture of two piles of donuts, the one for ourselves, is much bigger than the one for anybody else. Well, 
the biggest demonstration that we might need to see, well, how we behave sometimes. But hey, I don't want to be accused of shortchanging you this morning, so we'll carry on. But there's a tangibility to our money, to our resources, isn't there? To what we own, which makes talking about it in relation to our faith that bit more difficult. I sense Jesus knew that. And today we're in Luke chapter 12. And although we're reading from verse 13 on, as always, it's really important that we understand what's going on around those verses so that we get some of the context. And in those, we find Jesus talking about how we live. And there is, I'm warning you, some pretty powerful language that is being used here. Verses 1 to 3, Jesus reflects on his recent encounter with the religious teachers, the Pharisees. And he says to his followers, to his disciples, watch yourselves carefully so that you don't get contaminated with Pharisee yeast, Pharisee phoniness. You can't whisper one thing in private and preach the opposite in public. Powerful words. It's not the end of it. Verses 4 to 12, Jesus makes it clear to his disciples, to his followers, what it means to follow him. Stand up for me among all the people you meet, and the Son of Man will stand up for you before all of God's angels. But if you pretend you don't know me, do you think I'll defend you before all God's angels? Wow, you thought the money bit was hard. I wonder, have you ever been given away by your actions? Two weeks ago, Daniel, Sam and I went to watch West Ham play Liverpool. It was an end-to-end game, full of action. Passions were high inside the stadium. And at one point in the game, Unbelievably, to people like me, West Ham found themselves winning 3-1. And then, with about 10 minutes to go, Liverpool scored. Let's just save our donuts before they fall over. (laughs) This is what happens when you have too much for yourself, you see. So there we are in the West Ham Stadium. Liverpool have just scored to make it 3-2. And across the aisle to us, a small boy, maybe 10 years old, turns around to people sitting behind him, puts his finger to his mouth and says, shh. In that moment, for everyone who's sitting around us, his actions gave away his true allegiance. This wasn't a West Ham fan. He was a Liverpool fan sitting amongst the West Ham fans. In the old days, he might have struggled to get out of the stadium alive, but I'm thankful to say that his extremely embarrassed dad was able to calm him down and the rather annoyed West Ham fans who were sitting behind him. But this young lad had been given away by his actions. He was pretending to be a West Ham fan to get a seat in the stadium for this big game. But when it came to being tested, his behaviours gave him away. Which was exactly what Jesus was talking about. And in the midst of Jesus, speaking in this way to his disciples, someone from the growing crowd he was in yells out. Let's read what happens. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. 
I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So, how's your nervousness now having heard that story? You don't need to be nervous, let's pray. Father God, thank you for the power of your word. I pray, Lord, that this morning your word will speak into our hearts, not through anything I say, but through the way that the Holy Spirit works in me and through me. And that the way that the Holy Spirit works in the hearts of all of those who are listening. Lord, take these words, take this story that your son Jesus told and make it speak to us today. Make it relevant to us today. Change us through it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's dig deeper. Someone shouts from the crowd as we've read, Teacher, order my brother to give me my fair share of the family inheritance. And Jesus replies straight away, What makes you think it's any of my business to be a judge or a mediator for you. For me, there are two slightly strange things about Jesus's response. Firstly, as a rabbi or a teacher, Jesus could absolutely and legally be the judge in that situation. It was common in Middle Eastern times, uh, in ancient Middle Eastern times, with all their understanding and wisdom for rabbis to be asked to make the decision in situations like this one. Then, even stranger, Jesus then goes on to make it very clear how he feels about the situation, even though two minutes ago he said, what makes you think it's any of my business? And then suddenly he makes it his business. However, however, as he does, he makes it very clear what he considers to be at stake here, not money, not an inheritance, which is what the man has shouted about, but character. Jesus wasn't interested in how much money the man should have or shouldn't have. He was interested in the man's heart. And as he so often did, having warned the people of any type of greed or self-centeredness, he chooses to share a story with them to bring that to life, a story that might help them see a new, different, better way. And again, understanding the context becomes important. Looking deeper becomes important. I don't know whether you noticed when we read through that story, how the man depicted in the story addresses all of his thoughts, statements and questions to himself. The fact that he had no one to talk it through with, a big decision, as he did, is quite sad. Quite sad anywhere. But in Middle Eastern times, decisions like this would be discussed with friends. They would be discussed with family, even with neighbours. So the people listening at the time would have been saying, what's going on with this guy? Why Why is he on his own? He must, be, he must be really isolated. But did you also notice that in verses 17, 18 and 19, he speaks of my crops, my barns, my grain, myself. And he finishes all his surmising by telling himself he'll be able to take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. And he says that as though that's the pinnacle of life, as though he's telling himself, oh, this is as good as it gets. And then, then, in a master stroke at the end of the story, Jesus points straight back to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. 
it might even be the farmer in the story as we read it quoting from Ecclesiastes 8.15 because it says there, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them and them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. The writer from Ecclesiastes, though, has remembered something that our farmer hasn't. Our farmer wants to be able to add my life, his life, to the list of the other mys. But the truth is he can't. Because the days of life we have aren't ours. The days of life he had weren't his. Like everything else, they too are a gift from God, which this man discovers so starkly at the end of Jesus' story. Do you know there's a lot in the Bible that we have to interpret, that we have to work out, guided by the Holy Spirit to see what God might be saying to us. There's a beauty to this. The fact that God can use the same words to speak different things to different people at different times. Now, I don't want to suggest that's not possible with this parable. In fact, I suspect God is speaking to each of us in very different ways right now but I do want to suggest that there's very little middle ground in Jesus' words in this story. And I think that's the root of any nervousness that we may have as we talk about this subject. Because if we're honest, it's so often the middle ground that we find comfort in. It's the grey areas we like because we can explain them away. We can justify our actions because of the way we choose to interpret the words. In Luke 12, although Jesus chose not to be the one who would divide the man's inheritance between him and his brother, Jesus does divide. Not inheritance, not money, but in what it means to be a follower. He divides between those who are all in and those who are. He divides between those who talk the talk and those who walk the walk. He divides between those who've chosen Sundays, but not all week. And he divides between those who choose to help him build his kingdom here on earth. And those who become an obstacle to it. You know, so often Jesus chose the subject of money. If you were to do a quick count, you'd see that about, you know, I think it's 16 of the 38 parables, the stories that Jesus told, spoke about money in some way, shape or form. He didn't do that because money was the most important thing to him. But I believe he did it because he knew that it was so often a stumbling block to us. And he knew it was a place that so often exposes where our hearts truly lie. So now are you nervous? Because I don't know about you, but this challenges me. And the way that I live in a big way. What we choose to do with the resources that we've been given, our money, our possessions. At this point, we could add in our time, our willingness to serve, our gifting and talents, even our life here as well. 
what we choose to do with all of that which we've been given exposes where our hearts truly lie. Are we focused on what we can get out of life? Or are we focused on the things of heaven, on what we can give of ourselves to God, remembering remembering that all we have comes from him in the first place? In the words of Jesus spoken later in the same chapter, for where your treasure is, there your hearts will be also. Or in another translation, your heart will always be where your treasure is. So back to the donuts. If everything we have is a gift from God, how should we think about our money, our resources, our donuts? The answer is, is that when we are given resources like these, our first question, which means an everyday question, should be, Lord, what do you want me to do with these resources that you've given me? What do you want me to do for you with these resources that you've given me? I said to someone in a conversation last week that I firmly believed that we have the resources in our church family to both follow God into whatever ministry he has planned for us and to be able to complete the whole building project here. Let alone to be able to serve one another and this community. But as I reflected on that, as I looked at the passage we've read today, I felt the Holy Spirit was, was saying something different to me. And it's this. Not that we have the resources, but that God has given us everything that's needed to see the fruits of his ministry, of his mission in this place. That God has given us everything that's needed to see the building project realised. That God has given us everything that's needed to serve one another here and in this community. Our responsibility, church family, is to work out how together and individually we respond to what we've been given. So at the end of a message about money, At the end of a series about generosity, I'm not going to leave you with a financial ask. There's no standing order form that I want you to fill in this morning. Instead, all I have is an invitation. An invitation to come to the table to share in communion, to share in the bread and the wine. And as we arrive, I want you to come with me in a spirit of repentance. It's an unfashionable word, perhaps even one that makes us nervous, but I don't think you need to feel that way. Because you're coming into the presence of the one who gave you everything. Of the one who gave everything for you. Of the one who loves you unconditionally. Who wants nothing more for you than to discover what it means for you to walk in step with him. To walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Repentance is simply a chance to say sorry, to acknowledge our human brokenness, to acknowledge that our hearts are not always focused on the things or the places that they should be. But also to acknowledge all of those things, knowing that as we do through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. 
we are offered a fresh start, a new opportunity to use the resources and the gifts and the life that he has given us to do great things in God and through God and with God and for God. We're going to worship and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to prepare our hearts for the bread and the wine. And for God to speak as to how we should respond. Amen.
So it's great to hear from Steve as we sum up our series on generosity. And that's obviously something that's just going to take a, a whole load of work. We're not presuming that, uh, well, it's right, we've done that now, you're all going to be perfectly generous people, or we're going to be perfectly Absolutely. generous people. It yeah. requires constant work and, re- and attention and, and reminding. So it's been, it's, been, it's been a real privilege to be part of that, that series. Um, and I'm really chuffed that as a church we've, we've, we've been on that journey. And we do move to communion as a time and a chance to respond, particularly to what Steve said today. And I know for many of us, we've not done communion in the same way or as we might want to have done for quite a while now. So we're going to share communion together. Um, And as church ministers, we want to take the same challenge that Steve gave you. And that is that unfashionable word that Steve mentioned of of repentance. And um, it's kind of come out of our vocabulary a little bit. It is that turning back to God's way. And what a perfect opportunity over the bread, over the wine, for us to say to God, I want to turn back to you. My ways, 180, reverse and straight back to you. I want my ways to be your ways i want to be trying to achieve your will and as we remember jesus's sacrifice on the cross we have that perfect opportunity to do just that so we're just going to ask uh, steve to share uh, the words of 1 corinthians and then we'll have a short prayer and we'll move into our time together of sharing communion okay thanks peter so i'm reading from 1 corinthians chapter 11 these uh, words that paul wrote to the church in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Now, those words were, of course, written in remembrance. And there are other versions in the Bible um, where you hear Jesus' words at the time. And I could imagine confused disciples saying, well, where's this going and what's it doing? And weirdly, right now, we're taking communion together and you're doing it at home. And it's, we've been through unusual times. And during those times, we may well have fallen short and done things wrong. So let's just take this opportunity just before we break here, just to um, just spend a little, a little time in prayer and just to allow our hearts to be right before God. So I'm just going to pray and then we'll break and share uh, the bread. So Lord God, we just thank you so much for the sacrifice and for the opportunity of repentance and the fact that you are so willing to forgive and allow us to turn back to you. We thank you, uh, Lord God, for the fact that the bread here reminds us of your broken body and the power of that. The blood reminds us of your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So as we meet now, we ask that you give us just a supernatural spiritual love and acceptance Mm. of what you Mm. did and gave for us, Lord God. Help us through this normal bread, this normal wine, to understand deeper what this simple meal reenacts. Bless this time, Lord God, we ask Amen. Amen.
And the, the cup always reminds me of the story of um, Jesus turning water into wine as well. And the fact that in the, in the Gospel of John, this is right at the beginning. It's the first thing, it's sort of as if Jesus was straight away pointing to this act and the cleansing bowls and the, uh, and the, and the turning of this, of this water into the best wine. And the fact that that was a celebration and then it brings us to that, that point when Jesus again raises the wine. He takes the cup and he says, this is my blood shed for you. Just adding a, a further depth um, to some of the, to the other allusions and other times that we see wine throughout the Gospels. Um, it's this amazing theme of, of, of cleansing and of blood being the method of this cleansing. It really is a, a really sobering moment. So we take the cup and we remember the blood that was shed by Jesus. Lord God, the simplicity of this act masks an amazingly complex act of forgiveness. And it blows our mind what your son Jesus did on that cross. The only person who's lived a perfect life. The perfect sacrificial lamb on the cross for our sins. And we do ask, Lord God, that through this time of prayer and communion, through your spirit that you nudge us as to how we can repent and turn to you the the areas in our lives that we need to change and to let you have full access to. But also in our time of prayer, our minds turn to our congregation and some of the struggles of our family here at Newport Pagnell Baptist. And we're very, very aware, Lord God, that some of our family are in the midst of grief. And so we raise those individuals and those families to you now. We also know, uh, Lord God, that many of our family members um, are experiencing ill health. There are some of us who are sick, tired, weary, unwell. And so we ask, Lord God, that you bless those who are struggling in those areas right now. Lord God, we're also really aware that uh, many are, are anxious and there is still the ongoing world around us of uh, restrictions. We know that so many people, as we build up towards Christmas, have high hopes, but there's also concern and anxiety. For our young people, some of the rules in school are changing again and that may well bring back memories of last Christmas which we know was 
not as many people would have wanted it. So we do pray for uh, those who are feeling anxiety and tension. We do pray for our schools. So many of our young people are nearly done with this term. We really, really want to pray your protection over our young people, schools, teachers, parents. And we do pray for what the church is doing over Christmas. We want the opportunity to be able to really share your gospel and this Christmas story with our community. We thank you so much, Lord God, that we can bring these things to you in prayer. We thank you that you are a God who listens and you are a God who so wants to be involved in what we do personally, as families and as wider church family. So we raise these things to you, our concerns and our worries and our hopes and our fears. And we just invite you to have your say into it all. We pray all these things in your powerful, almighty name. Amen. Amen. Church family, I want to encourage you. What we've done this morning is simply share together as God's people. We've shared in worship, in songs. We've shared by looking at God's word. And then beautifully led by Peter, we've, we've shared in a meal together. Just people trying to do things God's way and being open to what God wants to do in our lives. And I have to say, this is the first time I think, Peter, you and I, I have shared, yeah, yeah. shared bread and wine together. And it's a special moment that we get to do it together, but that we get to do it together knowing that God's present with us. A simple meal. So I want to encourage you, church family, communion doesn't have to be, and worship doesn't have to be something that we save for Sundays. It can be for whenever we get together as God's people. Um, and wouldn't it be awesome if we were a church who were worshipping through the week, who were in the Bible through the week, who were sharing bread and wine through the week just when we got together with, with friends. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by that this morning, but challenged by it as well. So... Peter, thank you for the, the way that you've led us this morning. It's, um, it's been lovely. I hope you've had a fantastic time at home. Um, we're really looking forward um, to opportunities for how we can meet midweek, doing things differently over Christmas as well. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing you all at new, exciting, different opportunities over the week. But for the moment, our time here is done. Have a good week, church family. Take care and God bless. Mm -hmm.